Okay, so I think Okay, so let me start by recapping. It's the uh, last day of the summer school. Um, this, this afternoon we'll do a proper closing, but um, we are coming to the end of this hypergraph journey. And I know that this course has been a little bit um, just giving you definitions, just giving you ideas. There's not much to hold on to and start doing work. But I do want to hammer down those ideas. I, I do want to. Um, I, I don't want you to come out of this course at least with the basics of, of what these things are good for. So let me do a brief recap of the notions that we've seen. So remember that we began by thinking about foundations. Um, we introduced this multi-set theory machinery, which for anyone familiar with, with sets, is just sets where elements can repeat and you can have duplicates and copies. Um, and so we spent most of, uh, of that first lecture just thinking about how to arrange elements and how to think of the basic structures of, of, our, of our elements of our theory. So how to put them in bags, how to put them in sequences, or what we call tuples, et cetera, et cetera. So foundations uh, related to all these familiar um, ideas, set theory, data structures, ontology, the particles and matter of a physical theory, the lexicon of a, of a linguistic theory. Um, now, then we move to transformations, which broadly speaking meant these are the, the ways in which your elements can move around, can interact, can um, sort of operate with each other. And so we introduced this idea of an operation. Um, you know, in our fairly broad sense. And then we remember we recovered uh, familiar operations, such as the natural numbers, the integers, um, uh, the, ring, the ring of uh, fractions, et cetera, et cetera. So the basic ideas that uh, connected to the transformation were, of course, algebra, which is what we focused on. But in general, you can think of computation, you can think of phenomenology in philosophy. You can think in grammar, in linguistics, you can think in uh, evolution, in maybe genetics or biology, and definitely interactions when it comes to um, physical theories or, or chemical theories. Um, now, the core of the course was, of course, the concept of connection. This is what we wanted to build towards. <clears throat> the reason why we had this uh, section on algebra is just so that you can see that, you know, with a very minimal construction on top of just sets and bags and tuples, you can start to do everything that you're familiar with in mathematics. And you start to operate. Now, but the, the core is connection. This is what we wanted to, to discuss, which basically combines the static aspect of data structures, sets, multi sets, bags, tuples, etc., with the, the more transformational or, or operational set of things in, in the algebra. And we saw that, and hopefully, you, you were convinced that by constructing the adjacency matrix of a graph or a hypergraph in general. Uh, you you could see how totally static uh, notions such as number of uh, paths of certain length or adjacency between different shapes and motifs in a in a hypergraph were computed or explicitly found by doing algebra on the other side. So just by take this element, take this element, multiply them, where the elements are the adjacency matrices and so on. Okay, so that's where um, a connection took us. Um, Obviously, the uh, interesting ideas that, that connect to them are topology in mathematics, uh, network theory or graph theory, I guess, as well. But that was, goes without saying. Um, network theory, Mariology. So, Mariology was already mentioned yesterday in uh, Quant's talk. Um, so, obviously, it's the science of studying parts of a whole. Now, in terms of linguistics and text sciences, uh, have the notion of hypertext and, and this sort of codices and encyclopedias and things like that, where you definitely have a notion of connection also related to uh, Nick's talk yesterday. And then of course, in, in science more broadly, you have bonds between elements, between atoms, molecules, et cetera, and relations. I mean, you, can, you can think of 
you know, the most sophisticated phenomena that we observe, namely biology and technology in the world, these are highly connected, highly bound, uh, uh, highly uh, relational structures that we observe. So before we move on to the final, um, uh, to the final uh, theme of the, of the course, which very appropriately is structure, um, I wanted to convince you of something that was at the end of last lecture, which was, and was some of the questions that came up in other talks as well, which is, why would you ever need to go beyond um, order two? So why would you ever need to go from considering binary edges, so-called binary edges, or order, order two edges, to um, something like ternary edges that looks like this, right? So why would you ever want to distinguish between these two different things, right? Imagine there are three balls in the vertices of this triangle, right? So, I mean, that's a very valid question. You say, well, is this just a matter of cosmetics? Is it a matter of, you know, it looks better? I like to fill in, you know, when you're a kid, you're asking to fill in using drawings, I mean, you just want to fill everything in. So there is a, there is a phenomenon that many of you, are, I'm sure, are aware, with, uh, aware of, which is the Borromean rings. So I have two models of uh, connections here, and I'm going to ask some volunteers so, so we can test that those things are not equivalent. So, can I have three volunteers to hold these three rings? Please stand up. Okay, this side of the room, stand up and grab this. Let's, let's turn the camera so we can. So, grab this one, the long one, this one, that one. Okay. And then put yourself in a little bit of a triangle if you want. So, so there, there is now a ternary relation between the three of you. You are connected by this set of strings, right? Um, and so the question is, is that if we were to model this with a hypergraph, you know, if, if I were to draw you on the mathematical theory, should, should I use this connection or should I use this connection, right? So which are the criteria that I can use to decide on this? If I look at the... I look at the shape, I'm not really getting inspired. It's a complicated thing. I don't know what's going on. But what I would like to say is, well, what is the property of this? If I remove this physically, nothing remains. Everything is here. If I remove one of the connections here, the things are still connected. Right? So in other words, in, in, in this analogy, actually, the balls are the, are the rings. So if I remove one ball, so with the links, there's still a connected to two balls, which is connected to. Okay. Whereas in here, if I remove a ball, this triangle disintegrates, there's nothing else. So everything is okay. So let's see which one of, of them it is. So we, we're going to open one. So we're going to remove one from the collection, for example, yours. Um, and you just wrap one in and just pull, and everyone pull. Pull away. Okay. So we remove one, and there's still one remaining. So we're clearly in this situation, right? So no, no surprise. Okay, so why would you ever consider this if we're in this situation? Okay, so let's try with another one. Okay, just leave that one there on the table. That's fine. Okay. And now same turn. Okay, so we have the same situation. We have some tangle that looks very similar. Now we're going to do is exactly the same thing. We're going to remove one and see what happens with this. Okay. Um, everyone pull. And so they are all disconnected. Right? So we're going to plus for our audience. All right. Um, so clearly, this, this was a case of, um, of this kind of pitch. Right? So when we removed one of the elements, the entire bond disappeared. There was no other relation between the, the other remaining. So, so these these are called. Thanks very much. Just the string over there. So these are called the Borromean rings, and in general, there are um, there are. Okay, so so I'm gonna so. 
Maybe can, can you see me now? Yes, I have a smaller model here for a ring. Might have been pointing to. Can you see the camera now? Because I'm not sure that I'm sharing. Yes, okay. So, so let me. And it's also a nice illustration. So let me show you another model of the program. So, so, what just happened for those of you who didn't see from Zoom and for who they just joined us. So we, we just, we're just discussing why would you ever want to consider something that looks like this instead of something that looks like this. So imagine there are balls in the vertices of this triangle, right? And we devised an experiment. We directly observe nature and we realized that if you ever have, want to have a theory about people connected by strings, you definitely need to distinguish between these two things. You might think it's a very silly thing to have a theory about people connected by string. Yeah. I'm not the one to judge about what science should do. So we should study. So the two, the two tangles that, that we used for the experiment were made of the same thing. So the basic, the basic element is a loop of string. So just a normal loop of string. Um, and they are somehow tangled together. So three of them, they are somehow tangled together. And then three people grab one of the ends and, and sort of pull in, in three different directions. Um, and so we have this model and we have this model. So, so we have that model and we have this model. Right? So they look identical from, from your perspective. Three, three rings that are, uh, three loops of string that are, are not. Now the difference is that and this is very intuitive to see at this size is that if I pull any of the two here, you can see that the other, the other one is, is dangling in the middle, right? So clearly it's kind of irrelevant that this guy is here. So this is a binary connection between these two. This is a binary connection between the other two. And this is a binary connect connection between the other two. And if you see that the other one is dangling in the middle. So clearly this is altogether a ternary relation, a ternary bond. So this looks like a triangle. But it's made of pairwise bonds. So this is the model that we will, we will want to use with this. However, this one, sorry, this one, you can see, you know, it looks similar when I pull all of all three of them in different directions. But when I pull just two of them, you can clearly see that there's two rings and there's one in the middle, right? It's very clear that there's two separate rings and there's one in the middle that is bonding. So, and you know, it's completely symmetrical. I can change it. Nothing, nothing changes, I can change this. It's, it's always the same, right? So it's very intuitively clear that this is a bond that depends exactly on the three of them, right? So the kind of model that you, you'd like to use is, is this, right? So um, that point being made, um, I hope this justifies our interest in, uh, in higher order representations of connectivity because that's the entire, that's the entire game. So, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. I don't want to say that. Okay, so we are moving on to the final part of the course. And this final part of the course is, should be an introduction uh, of category theory. So category theory was mentioned yesterday quite heavily in the discussion on um, exact philosophy or mathematical philosophy. Uh, <clears throat> and so I want to give you the essential philosophical flavor of this of this theory. And I won't give you all the axioms and, and, and all, the, all the details because there's actually quite a fair amount of freedom in how to present it. And one of the points of my hypergraph approach is that it gives you a completely diagrammatic way to understand category theory. So it's a way to really uh, approach the theory just by drawing, right? literally by doodling on, on, the, on the page. So before that, let, let me let me stay at a more philosophical level. So category theory, as was mentioned yesterday, is a theory about structure. So it's a theory about relation. It's a theory about connectivity. It's a theory about how things relate to each other and how they fit together in a, in a complex, you know, potentially complex uh, framework. So the, the concept of structure connects to obviously category theory, as they say, but you know, systems architecture, notion of paradigm, when you have a you know, philosophical theory, um, semantics in a, in a language, you know, the things that 
you know, the, the meaning generation and the structure of meaning and so on. And in, in science, you, you need to think of your larger theories, your larger all-encompassing theories and things like cosmology or ecology uh, and things like that. So, but obviously you should bear in mind that, that reality seems to be quite fractal in this sense. You can always zoom in and it seems that you can always find levels of organization, levels of structure that seem sort of cosmological in that small scale. And, and so this is sort of a scaling dependent notion of structure. Okay, so just to uh, put some, um, uh, some references on the screen, the, um, it's, I think it's, this was mentioned yesterday actually is the uh, NCAT lab. So you, you have this page, which is essentially a wiki, um, with, which, which has a lot of uh, the definitions of, of higher category theory that are relevant. Now, the second book, uh, Tom Lesler is a former colleague of mine at the University of Edinburgh. It's one of the most widely used uh, books for category theory. It's very easy to follow. You will see that you will learn the basis of categories in three or four pages. It's really quite, quite nice. Now, um, uh, the end category cafe is a blog. So this is just a website that you know, if you check every couple of weeks, you will see some nice articles about category theory and how it's been applied in many different ways. Now, for the higher category theory and the more technical stuff, I have a couple more references if you're interested. But this is really technical uh, and, and much more uh, advanced. For, for, for okay, so let's begin with the actual content. It's about sharing here. So, so, what are we trying to do? Um, I mean, I want I want to define something that looks like a category eventually in this lecture, but you have to ask, ask yourself, okay, what do we do with, when we do mathematics? Right? What is the, what is it that we do when we do mathematics? So basically, most of the time, what we're doing is we take a bunch of symbols, we give them some kind of order or system. And so we are tidy about them, and then we start combining them, and we start sort of building uh, extra extra symbols or, or more complicated symbols out of that. So, in order to set up such a system, there are some principles I think that are necessary to guide your um, your definitions. Because in mathematics, it, sometimes it can feel that you're completely enslaved in a small case that you have no freedom. And that's where you know you're a young undergrad and you're forced to do calculations and you, you think you're doing everything wrong and it's all about oh I put a minus sign and everything's like that and you feel like you're really caged and the, you know everything is super determined and you're, you're you know have no freedom or when you actually discover this level of axiomatic mathematics you realize oh wait so I can't find everything so everything goes it's, you, and there's something you see this vast amount of freedom that you didn't know existed and so the interesting story happens kind of in the middle where you know if you're completely general and you just define things for the sake of it you're doing nothing I mean, it's, that's completely meaningless if you're completely enslaved by too many rules and you're too afraid to make mistakes then you make no progress so we have to go to some kind of middle ground where the interesting mathematics uh, takes place so i have listed five principles of you know of, of how to build a good mathematical theory i mean this is really uh, informal don't take this too seriously but um, let me just list them on the on the black. So the first principle, I mean, they're going, they're going to sound very uh, abstract and very pretentious in a way, but bear with me. So the first principle is abstract. So the principle of abstraction is summarized as only keep essential information. Okay, this was mentioned by Ivan yesterday. Second principle is the principle of identity, which says effectively um, any element, now element means any part, any, any object, any symbol, anything. Any element is, and which we identify, Call it identity with 
it's minimal expression. It's minimal. Okay. So these are very vague general statements, but I think they're going to help us have some order. Third principle is the principle of universality. <clears throat> this says the entity of any element of an element um, is its relation to all other elements. Okay, so that's what we call it universality because we're saying what makes this object this object is how it relates to all the other elements. Yeah. So these are these three are kind of like an ontology, if you want. If you want to sound more, more philosophical, this is sort of you know the, the, the principles of ontology. Of what are the things that we're going to be considering? Where are my stuff in my theory? These are the properties that that thing should have. Now the other two, which is more about semantics and more about uh, formalism. Are the following. So it's the principle of drawing. This sounds very childish, but it's actually important. It says um, information about elements can only be encoded in drawings. Now, what are drawings? Drawings are not just things you can literally draw, but in a, in a context, a drawing is something that a human being can feasibly manipulate and produce, right? So you could, you could interpret these as literal drawings and still be a good definition, in my opinion. But, you know, especially in the technological era that we live in, we have Computers that can generate graphics and can generate environments where humans can effectively draw in a higher sense that is not just literally kind of doodling. And finally, there's the, the principle of uniqueness, which is very similar. I mean, it's just doing two words with effectively the same uh, principle, which says that um, unique, and it's a bit redundant, but unique. Uh, diagrams. So, um, let me say, runs or diagrams. Diagram, diagram for better, more general work. So, unique diagrams uh, specify meaning for. So these, these are, so, okay, so this is more about uh, formalism, so symbolic. So, so these are the desirable principles that, uh, in my opinion, a, a good modern mathematical theory should have, right? Um, and so these on, on, on the page look completely abstract and useless, and they are unless we start uh, sort of making things more concrete. So let's make things more concrete. Um, maybe I can actually use this for the blackboard and do this and then we'll erase that. Um, so let's, so let's define a category. Let's, let's define my notion of category, which is a little bit more general than the usual notion of category, um, uh, but it coincides exactly in the right realm. So. Okay, so what is a category? So a category has several several ingredients. And the, the way you should think of a category is that it has several things that are floating somehow in space. And the all the properties and actions that you're going to assume tell you how these things floating in space relate and how they operate. But the basic ingredients are actually quite simple. So on the one hand, we have objects. 
normally we're going to give a label to all this realm called a singular category. We're going to sorry, curly C or something like that, right? We're going to give it. Don't think of this as just, as just a set or anything. It's just a general label to refer to this category. So it's made of several things. The first thing is objects. You typically would denote it as ob of C. And sometimes, you know, we, we might say that this is just C. Sometimes we just simplify and say this is just a set. So this is a this is a collection of primitive terms. In other words, this is just a bunch of symbols. As far as, as formalism goes, at this stage, this is just a bunch of stuff that you can label. Okay. Um, you know, if you're interested in set theory, we're not assuming that these things are sets. They can be bigger than sets in, in a way. Uh, if you're interested in set theory, if you're not, this is just, you can think of this as a set, no problem whatsoever. Second ingredient is what we call morphism. And the generally, Morphisms of a category will be will be denoted by hom of this, but again, sometimes we might just say that you know this is the, the category, as I said. So don't be confused by that. So what are morphisms? So morphisms are generally relations, relations in a in an abstract sense. At this point, is just a guiding uh, way of saying things: relations between um, objects. So let me very briefly explain where the word morphism comes from. So morphism uh, comes from the word homomorphism or homeomorphism, isomorphism or you know, epimorphism, all these kind of morphisms. And remember that these were in the context of traditional uh, set theory and then more dimensional mathematics, these were sort of maps that maybe send you a set to a set. And maybe if you had a, you know, if maybe you had a map from a group to a group. So this is a group with an operation star and this is a group with an operation triangle so we call this a group homomorphism when you take f uh, of little g star little g prime and this should be taking first f from g and then f of g prime and then doing the triangle here so we would call such a map a group homomorphism and that's where where all this category theory story started in in the in the first half of the, the 20th century, yeah, towards the, the half of the 20th century. But that's just where the name comes from. Um, but our, our definition is much more general than this, at this, at this point. Um, okay, so what do I mean exactly by relations? Okay, so these are, give me any collection of objects, right? And by a collection, I really now refer to my first lecture, any potentially multi-set, any tuple, any mix of objects, any data structure made out of objects, and I will give you a set. So, for example, um, I'm going to typically denote objects. Um, so, I'll, I'll just explain it. So, typically, I'd say that A, B, C. These are you know, set theory notation to denote that they are objects. And so, these are labels for elements there. And so, what I would say is. Fix a collection of objects, I'll give you uh, a set of morphisms. So if I fix, for example, one single object, I can denote like that, or I can denote like that, like a one tuple or a one bag, which is no difference, then the morphisms uh, in a category is an assignment to this data structure. So let's just write it like this to something that we call C of that. And this is a set. That's it. Right? So potentially empty. This is very important. So this is potentially empty. The reason I say this is important is that this, this definition is going to be very general. And for it to work with conventional definitions, you need to remember uh, that this is a potentially empty set. When you say it's a set, it's always potentially empty because the empty set is a set. Um, but just to bear that in mind. This is very boring. This is the only thing you can do with one object, but what if I take two objects? So if I take two objects, I can, for example, take a two bag, so A and B. And so this will be assigned some set on two bags. So the way you can understand this um, is, so 
to get that this is a set. The way you can see this is that you know A is a vertex of, of some, some graph, some hypergraph that I'm using as a diagram, and then morphisms of, of, of this of this kind of C A are just one edges in a hypergraph sense, right? So I will and but the, so they are a set, so I can label them. So I can call this one little a, I can call this other one little b. So these are just things that only know a. So these are kind of labelings of just a piece of information of a because it's a single one. Let me do it for, for a pair and you will see that this gets more interesting. So when you have two objects a and b, what you're saying is that the bag a b right so it's just a pair a b with no sense of order is has now as, assigned to it a set so either empty or there's a multiplicity of things that you can denote and put your finger on. so you can have this one call it f you can have this one call it g you can have this one call it h and you would write that f g or h are elements of um the morphisms between the a b bag right so in other words if you specify a collection of objects and okay let me let me do another example so let's do tuples let's do two tuples so order pairs right so from an order pair of objects a b uh, let me call the next one so we have two different objects so i assign a set i call it C of the data structure, so the, the kind of uh, collection of objects, which in this case is a two tuple. And so the way I represent it is by saying that I have something that is now direct. Let's call this phi. Let's call this phi like that. Let's call this psi. Like X and this is Y. You would say that uh, phi, psi, phi, whatever. So they are in. C of now tuple A B. Right. Okay. So but it, but this goes on, this list goes on to infinity in many directions, to, to infinity in the order of your morphism. The order of a morphism is the number of objects that, that it, it bounds. Um, but also in kind of morphism, so in type of morphism. So just to uh, Bit for the ternary level, you know, I can have ABC. This is a sign of something called C. So remember, this is a bag, so there is no sense of ABC in that order. So I can maybe use a bit more compact notation, just write them a little bit more compactly like this. And, and these correspond to things that would look like this. You draw your objects, so Y and Z. And then you, you do a field time. Okay, so and so, so these are diagrams. What are diagrams? They are hypergrams. Right? So that's why I needed to speak about hypergraphs for about two lectures before I could tell you about categories, because the most Neat and, and simple introduction into categories, in my opinion, if you want to really take diagrams seriously, is to first know about diagrams without any structure, without any extra considerations. And then you say, well, these are good for building a certain kind of field. And this is the certain kind of field that, that they build. So, so this is okay. So these are the ingredients of what we could call a pre category in a sense. So this is just ingredients. I didn't say anything about how things work, I just said what things are. Right? I tell you there's a collection of objects, you know, A, B, C, you know, all things. This can be highly infinitary, it can be, you know, finite, it can be whatever, just some collection of things. Um, and then for each data structure that you can build out of them, so particularly, you know, finite with finite numbers of objects, I mean, you can consider infinite ones, but then we get into very much. So in, in this definition, perhaps just think that we only consider finitely many, but there's already infinitely many of them in the same number of total sets, you get a set of morphisms for each of them. So, and they all look exactly like hypergraphs. So all the technology that you know from hypergraphs, all the terminology about, yes? Should this be ABC in the diagram? 
Uh, yes, sorry, yes, of course. Um, yes. Yes, thanks. Um, so, what is that? I lost my train of thought. Sorry. No, no, no. I mean, it's, you're right. It's, it's type. Um, so, ah, uh, yeah. So, you can apply all this hypergraph technology, all this hypergraph terminology to morphisms, right? So, or two diagrams in general. Morphisms are just the, the uh, elements that, that constitute the, 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 the diagrams. But the diagrams themselves are hypergraphs, and they're labeled hypergraphs. I mean, hypergraphs are just things without the labels, and all the labels on top is what makes them part of a category, part of a category. So we haven't said what it means to, to be a category. We just said these are the ingredients that are going to allow us to. So let's take those ingredients and make them work. So, for example, you could think of all the names, all the taxonomy. You remember we spent some time just doing the taxonomy of hypergraphs, directed, undirected, simple, connected, all that kind of stuff. All the all the terminology applies to diagrams. And whenever you say those words referring to diagrams, what you have to imagine is that meaning for a hypergraph, and then put some labels on top, right? And typically, you would you would find things like. Um, a hypergraph that is simple and then it has the morphisms that correspond to it are, um, you know, have exactly the same form, exactly the same shape. So you can basically extend all this notion of, of hypergraphs to diagrams and therefore extend it to categories as well. So you can, if for example, say all the diagrams in your category are always going to look this way, then you can say that the category is of that kind. Okay, so. So we're, we're missing basically one ingredient to complete the definition of category and one condition. So in terms of ingredients, this is a very, as you can imagine, what I, what I gave you is just a, a bunch of things, right? I just told you there's a basic set of, if we're talking hypergraphs, would be like the vertices. Uh, if we're talking categories, just some abstract, basic primitive elements, sort of the atoms. And I told you that they form bonds between. That's all I said, but I didn't say how they interact at all, right? So how they interact is what we call, uh, the other ingredient is a countable uh, family of rewrite groups. So, if you've seen hypergraph rewrites before, then I shouldn't say anything else. But um, let me specify with this by example. So, what are typical um, rewrite rules that are considered in this? What is a rewrite rule? So, a rewrite rule is something that inputs a diagram. Right? And then it outputs another diagram. Okay, that's a rewrite. It's very abstract at this point, but the way we keep this uh, formal and rigorous is by labeling all our elements and, and being able to keep track. So let me give you examples of, of rewrite rules that are So. The unar rewrite rule is as follows. So the unar rewrite rule is if you give me any object in your category, A, right? This is a diagram. This is the simplest diagram you can draw, the smallest diagram you can draw. Then what I'm going to do is draw the second simplest diagram you can draw, which is draw the same vertex. Same object, but now with a tuple morphism that goes from, from A to itself. Okay. And you could you could also draw this as if you wanted, which is the same as saying A or A. 
Okay, so this is a unit. We have a rule. Let's uh, find the dagger. We write rule. So where's the dagger? If you've seen, um, well, Oscar already mentioned dual spaces. If you've seen quantum mechanics, you might be aware of the transpose. Or in general, if you've done matrix theory or relation theory, you know what a transpose of a matrix is or a transpose of a relation is. So this is what's behind the scenes here if you want some examples. But a dagger is simply the following. If you give me a two tuple morphism like this, so that second kind there, then I'm going to simply flip it. It goes from A to B, so I'm going to rewrite it. It's going to go. B to A. Very simple. Okay, let's introduce some more interesting um, right rules. So, binary composition. Okay, so, uh, so binary incident. So, by the way, I am, I should, I should say, I am going to restrict myself to this kind of, this kind of, um, Morphism. So this, you know, these dots, these are all the kinds of morphisms I'm going to be considering for sake of example, because if I go higher, the drawings become very hard to draw. So, um, so uh, binary incidents is as follows. Um, remember that we said when we were describing um, motifs in a hypergraph yesterday and how to find paths and find sort of intermediary adjacency and so on. We found this, this sort of dagger. So imagine that you have two back morphisms between elements or objects ABC. They look like this, undirected, because I give you the example of the undirected one. You could also consider the directed one, which would be like yesterday. Um, and so the rewrite of this, whenever I find this, is you relate. Uh, all of ABC. Right? So this is what this tells me is that whenever you can draw a diagram that looks like this, then you automatically get a, a diagram that looks like that. And then if you want, we can further label stuff. I mean, I started labeling up here and I should keep labeling. So if this is called F, this is called F diagram. If this is called F, uh, this is called G, F in this way, then this guy here is called, for example, incidence of F G. Right. Um, what else? Okay, let's do let's do composition. So binary composition. So. This is the one that we saw yesterday. So this is like the composition of functions between sets, the multiplication of matrices between vector spaces, or you know, all these kinds of things. Um, so the motif that we detect. So the, by the way, yeah, this is this is uh, the input motif and this is the output motif. The input diagram, output diagram. So the input diagram is what you remember from yesterday. This and this. It's written to A, B, C, and put up the tables, F and G. So, what it does is very similar to that one, but remember yesterday we said, well, we ignore the intermediary. We say if there is an intermediary, there is a one step intermediary, we, we go straight into our target. So, we bypass B and we get from A to C if there is an intermediary. Okay. And we typically uh, denote that by. F composed with G. So this looks very similar to composition of functions, multiplication of matrices, composition of relations, all this ordinary mathematical stuff. But in this framework, this is just another option in a universe of options of rewrite rules. Okay. And let me give you a final one just to uh, use some of that stuff. So let's do a ternary composition. And this is the so called BM. Composition. In some some people, but sorry, uh, so 
this is, I need to draw, remember what a rewrite rule is. I need to input a diagram and output another diagram. So the diagram I'm going to output is whenever I find objects x, y, that's it. A, B, C in this particular pattern, you have an object here in the middle, call it X. Oh, X. Um, you have uh, names T, R, S. Then, as we saw yesterday with the, with the matrix multiplication, the cubic multiplication was sort of the inspiration for this rule, you collapse and you forget what happened in the middle. So remember these are golden triangles. So similar to this, where, sorry, similar to this, in which you had something that connected some external objects and there were some in the middle, and they sort of, we ignore them and, 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 and we rewrite them. The outcome of this is, well, X still floating there. So we remember that X was not written and we are left with, with ABC, with a singular triangle. And, you know, we want to refer to the, the fact that TRS were involved in the multiplication. So TRS can be written in a circle or something. So you remember your labels and your, your new triangle has a well-defined label. This is the, this symbol here is the analog of quadratic F composed G on top of your arrow, right? Which is the most Okay, so, so this is what rewrite rules are. So any category, any one category will be such a specification, a set of objects uh, for each uh, mix of objects for each collection of objects that you pick up, you will have a set of morphisms between them of a certain type. And, and so you have all this, you know, infinite tower of, of possible morphism sets or so-called home sets at times. Um, many of them can be empty, right? But in general, you have all of them. And that's sort of the static ingredients and the, so like your atoms and, and, and bonds. And then this set of rules that tell you if you give me this particular diagram built with your objects and, and, and morphisms, then you can also find this, this diagram in your, in your diagram. So these are, you, know, you can understand these as atoms and molecules just floating. You can understand these as reactions. Right? You, you find this floating around, it reacts and gives you that. These two things come together, react, and give you that. Right? So that's, that's how you're thinking about it. Okay, but fine. This seems that, you know, when I say this, if, if you know category theory, if you know the definition of a category, which is quite simple, um, you know that it, is, it will be enough to say, well, there's something like this because there are identity arrows on, on your objects, and there's something like this, there's composition of arrows, two arrows, you, you, you get a new arrow. And then you're probably thinking, well, but what about axes? I mean, these are not just random things you can do, they satisfy some very strong conditions when, for example, you know that we call this identity arrows because we, when we compose, we compose them with uh, any other arrow, we get the same arrow back, right? Because it's like the identity matrix and you multiply gives you the same matrix back. So we are missing one uh, condition for our for our definition of that, and and this is not a it's not an extra ingredient. It's not so we already have the entire list of ingredients to go to the shop and we start to cook our, our recipe. Um, but we need one, one final extraction for the dish to come up right. And this final extraction is called the principle or the yeah, principle of diagrammatic integrity. So don't search for this term because I coined this term. Um, but, but the idea is very simple. I call it the principle because it's not really at this stage. I can give it to you as a simple mathematical statement about hypergraphs, about hypergraphs and that I spent two hours uh, telling you all the exact details because the set theory of hypergraphs is complicated. And, but the concept is very simple. It can be explained very, very simply. 
So what is the principle of diagrammatic integrity? The principle of diagrammatic integrity is an axiom, it's a condition that we're going to impose on how we apply our rewrite rules. So rewrite rules are just a way that, you know, if you give me a diagram that you literally draw, any random diagram, I just scan it, see if any of them apply, and if some of them apply, you apply it, right? And so if you see another that one that checks, you scan for it, it applies, you apply it. And so you get this multi-way uh, um, system of rewrites that give you a, a huge diversity of possible paths in general. So the principle of diagrammatic integrity is some kind of constraint in how you're doing. It. You're not just mindlessly rewriting everything over and over again. The fact that you have labels and the fact that you have sets between the labels, right? For any labeled objects, you have actual sets. It means that when more than one morphism exists between the same number of objects, you can directly compare them. By comparing them meaning, I mean, they belong to the same set, so they can be either equal or not equal, right? So you have actual control over when you have the, the same the same uh, morphism between the, the, sorry, when you have several morphisms between the same uh, structure of objects, like for example here, that I have three directed morphisms between X and Y, or here that I have three undirected ones, or here that I have two on, on a single object. Um, you can say things about those morphisms. They can either be equal or not equal, or maybe your sets have, can have a little bit more structure or something like that. So the principle of diagrammatic integrity states the following. So it can be stated in, in two lines, like single lines, but to articulate it mathematically, it would take some work and I'll just explain the idea. So the principle of diagrammatic integrity means that from any simple diagram, now, remember what simple meant is a hypergraph term that is now being applied to a diagram, which is a label hypergraph in this sense. Um, rewrites can only produce simple diagrams. So, it almost sounds like a poem. Right? It's, uh, it's a very simple rule. And you know, you can even call it the principle of diagrammatic simplicity or just the principle of simplicity. Because it's about, if you have simple diagrams, your rewrites should keep them simple, right? So what does this mean in practice? Let's see what this means in practice. Um, I probably, So in practice, this principle is what gives us our axiomatic axis. axis. If you've seen the definition of category before, you know that units, sorry, uh, that identity arrows behave as identity arrows, meaning that they compose with other arrows like they did, they, they change nothing. You know that uh, a dagger in a category it's, or for example, taking the transpose of a matrix gives you back the same matrix when you do it twice. Transpose of the transpose is the same matrix again. These kinds of properties could not be seen from the rules I, I, I drew there. So remember, I'm just going to talk here principle of diagrammatic integrity. Uh, simple diagram. That tend to by rewrite to simple diagram. Now, bear in mind, this is, this is an act, right? this is something I am forcing, I am uh, constraining my rules to apply in this way. So let's see what this, let's see what this implies. Okay. Um, let's take the data. For example, the dagger was a, can be thought of as the as a transpose of a matrix, right? Or the, if, the, if you're taking invertible maps, it can be the inverse of a map, right? So let's begin with this diagram. Right? Imagine that we have the dagger, the dagger rule. So here I just summarize that I have this and it rewrites to 
this. Right? I just remember that my, my, my category has this rule. Okay, so let's begin with this diagram. And I say, can I spot this pattern, the input pattern? Yes, I have that pattern. So I can rewrite it. I rewrite it. So I knew, oh, let me play with this. Uh, so I knew diagram, there is a diagram. Right? So when we rewrite on a diagram, the rule is abstract. But on a, on a diagram, we're just adding stuff. So we still have F going this way. We're just adding new things, right? That's what the rewrite would be. They add uh, the, the, to, the, to, your, to your hyper. Okay, so in this case, I have one morphism from A to B, F, and one morphism from B to A, F that. So we're still simple, right? This is still a simple hypergraph because directed, directed edges are depend on the, on the orientation. However, now you can here, you can apply uh, the, same, the same rule because now we have two such patterns, right? The pattern of two objects and a directed arrow happens twice now. So I can apply the, the same rule again, but now in, in two possibilities, I can say, okay, I can either take F and do F dagger, right? So let's do that. So I have A, B, I have, and I have these two morphisms here. I had uh, F dagger already. I had F going this way. And, and I'm, I'm detecting this F here and say, I'm gonna take its dagger. So I'm gonna write F dagger, but F dagger is already there. So this rewrite is, is that. I mean, I, I could draw, if you want, a dagger again, but that's the same thing. It has the same name. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a new thing. Okay, so we didn't do anything here. So technically, this is not a real Fine. So we didn't break the principle of integrity. This is what I mean. From simple, we went to simple because it was the same diagram. Okay, good. But how about this direction? If we take F dagger, we can just take F dagger dagger, right? And so, because F dagger goes from B to A, now F dagger dagger will go from A to B. So we have F dagger dagger going in that direction. And we have the same stuff as before. We have F dagger, but we also have F. We started with F. So now this diagram is nonsense because if we forget about the, the other direction and we just focus on A, B in this, in this direction, this is a non-simple, in this case, directed to graph. Right. It's a, it's a non-simple um, hypergraph, and therefore this principle is going it's going to force us to make it simple. Right. Simple must go to simple. So this means that remember this this here in the middle. Forever. So for this hypergraph to be simple, we would require that this arrow and this arrow are the same. Right. So what that means is that the label that we use for f, uh, sorry, the, the label that we use for f dagger dagger, which is this one should actually be the same label that we use for it. And so this is your familiar equation. The transpose of the transpose of the transpose. Okay, very cool. Okay, let's do another example because I don't want to run through the entire half an hour break. Um, okay, so this is a not very spectacular example of the principle. So you see how we enforcing the principle of diagrammatic integrity, we got the property of the transpose. Okay, let's get a more spectacular application of the principle of, of diagrammatic integrity. So I'm going to ask the audience, what is the property, what is the algebraic property of composition of, of maps? What is it called? When you compose things, you have three things that you can put the brackets to, the, to those sides. How is that called? Associativity. Yes, exactly. So let's see if we can somehow find that just by applying the principle of diagrammatic integrity. So imagine that you, that you have this rule, you have the, the composition rule, it should be in your notes. You have this rule, whenever you find this kind of thing, you rewrite this kind of thing. Okay, and with the labels as I wrote, them. the labels are always, they should be there. Okay, so, this means whenever you find some diagram, I'm gonna to try to spot for this pattern. And then if I find it, I'm gonna rewrite that. Okay, so I'm gonna give you one diagram and let's make it together. The 
let's label everything A, B, C, D, F, D, H, F, D, H. Okay? Not too complicated a diagram. It's basically the next bigger diagram that is not directly the root, right? Okay, so let's see what we can do. Should we start with this? And let's see how many patterns can you see in that diagram? Two, right? Okay, so we, we know that we're going to have two outcomes to begin with because we, we see two. Okay, so let's do this one first, right? A, B, C, it's that pattern. So let's apply the rewrite rule. And so the rewrite, the rewrite rule tells us that this gets rewritten to, well, B is going to be dangling up there. And then A and C are down here. And they have now a morphism like that. And that we said we call F circle G and the other thing gets untouched because that's how we write rules apply. They only, they only affect where they match the pattern. Okay, so that was that side. Let's do the other side. So the other side now is going to have C down here dangling and then well, A, B is going to be unchanged. F, and from B to D, I'm going to collapse according to the rewrite. Okay, so I'm going to call this Name that you should have G H. Okay, very good. But we can keep going, right? So you see this pattern again, don't you? There's that pattern there, there's that, that pattern there. Okay, so let's do this one here. Okay, so here. Um, yeah, so, so, okay, so first of all, these two are diagrams on the, set, on the same set of vertices. So I'm drawing them separately so that I'm not modeling the picture. Okay. So you should imagine that I'm adding these things on top of this. One. So I'm drawing this extra arrow here, and this extra arrow here, that one and that one. So I just, I just draw the rewrites for clarity. Okay, so what, what is the, the result of this? Well, I, I'm just taking now, oh, sorry, C. So C now is going to be dangling. And here's a B still dangling up there. C is chilling down here. And A and B now have a morphism. And the name is F circle G, F circle G, circle H. Right? Just right on that side. And now on this side, I have. I have B now chilling up here, C chilling down here, and now A and B, and I have an arrow between them. And the name of that arrow is F circle, now bracket, that's what I had first, G circle H. So, no, this was a simple hyper, simple diagram. This is a simple one, right? Because this arrow here, H is the same as H, no problem. And this arrow here goes from A to C, which we have none before. So it's still simple. This one, F is the same as F, and GH is between B and D, which we have none before. However, when we get all the way down here, we find that A and B have two arrows. We have this arrow and this, this arrow, right? Where this arrow is this label, and this arrow is this label. So this arrow is F, G, H, and this label is F, G, H, right? So suddenly we have, and you can see more clearly down here that between A and D, there are now two arrows. So, so this hypergraph, after applying all the possible rewrite rules, became non-simple. At least at this step became non-simple. So then the principle of diagram simplicity applies and it forces you that those two labels should be the same. So what I write is that F G H equals F G H in this way, which is of course associative. It's like magic, right? It's an extremely small and elegant axiom 
And by doing the extra work of thinking about uh, categories like rewrite rule systems, it allows us to recover the algebraic theory that is normally the hard part of the theory. Right. So I don't want to go much longer uh, because you know we want some break before the, the next session. Um, but just to just to uh, have a, a sense of closure in, in announcing that we're going to define a category, let's let's recover the definition of category as it's normally defined. So a category will be so a category is it's going to be that kind of thing, which I'm going to, so that, meaning this pair of things, objects and morphisms, C such that the following. So objects of C, no constraint, anything goes, any large class of things, primitive elements. But for your morphisms, you're going to be extremely specific. You're going to say that your morphisms are only arrows, right? So how we say that is that for all a, B objects, um, C, C of A, B, which is the two tuple, right? So that said, this is, um, yeah, I'm going to do the negation of this. So, so, so um, say, yeah, so for all this, these sets are the only non empty sets. So that means that if you want to consider this category, where are the morphisms of a single object, or where, where are the morphisms of like a triangle of objects, etc., these are always the, the empty sets. So basically, it's a category in which the only kind of relation is arrows between between. Okay, so that's specifying the ingredients and sort of the chemistry of the of the of the theory. In a category is two rewrite rules. One rewrite rule, which from any object A gives you the identity arrow on A, which you can diagrammatically write like this, if you want. One on A and composition. Uh, yeah, I would not write a so that's a category, right? It's it's as simple as that. You say it's a category where there are only arrows, so only two tuple morphisms are considered, everything else is empty, and your rewrite rules are. Give me an object. I know there's at least one arrow from that object to itself, and give me two morphisms forming a V, you know, forming this sort of corner in in, in this sort of uh, flowing order, sequential order, and then I can compose. I can sort of like follow the path. That's it. If you add to this the PDI, the principle of diagrammatic integrity, then you recover the definition of category. I mean, you saw that we recovered associativity, so that you, you don't have to believe. You have to take my word. Just take my word that the principle of diagrammatic integrity means that if you take a diagram that looks like this, just a generic diagram that looks like this, you can append an identity here. A, B. You can append an identity here. And by composition, this becomes now. Uh, 1a on f, but this is now a, a, a morphism from a to b. So you find two morphisms from a to b. You start with one, we only start with f, and because we could re rewrite an identity, and because we could compose them, we end up with another morphism of the same kind. So f and 1a of f are morphisms of the same kind. So they should be the same, and that's the property of identity. That's one a composed with f is f. That's the accent of identity. So that's, I hope, a much more accessible uh, way to one, on the one hand, motivate categories, on the second hand, compute things within categories, which is to use uh, rewrite systems. So people have disliked rewrite systems historically because they are non-deterministic. They, they don't tell you where they are going, right? Because you, 
you, if you have your, an initial state that is big, you just need to apply rules until, and you don't you don't know if it's gonna terminate or not. It's impossible to know in principle because you need to apply the rules to get there. Um, but but if you're interested in doing algebraic theories and sort of math, mathematics like kind of theories, um, things are quite small and they are manageable. You can do them by hand, and, and, and this and this still still makes sense. And, you know, um, to me this is this was a this is a bit of a spoiler of my my own version of research because um, having such a powerful simple principle, Martina, I don't think you were here, but we're saying that the, the, all you add to this system is a is, a, is the constraint that if you begin with a simple diagram, simple in the sense of hypergraph, so it's a simple hypergraph as a diagram, any of your rewrite rules should output a simple diagram. So when it doesn't, for, for example, in the case of, uh, of, of, um, of associativity, so if you take three morphisms of GH in this way, like a little zigzag, you can rewrite according to composition, and you get to the point where you know these are all simple diagrams all the way until you get to the end and you find that between A and B, there are two arrows that are potentially different. They have different labels, right? So the principle of diagrammatic simplicity or diagrammatic integrity forces you that those two labels are actually the same, which is the axiom of such a field, right? So it's a way to completely re-encode uh, the, the notion of category. And most importantly, and this is the, the, bottom, the, the punchline of my course, this is not specific of binary compositions. This principle of diagrammatic simplicity, we apply to a sort of a unary assignment where given an element gives you a, a, a morphism. We apply to a binary assignment where given two morphisms gives you a, a new morphism. But we can also apply it to, to things that, that look like this, like given a, given a set of ternary morphisms gives you another ternary, ternary morphism. And we have discovered, and you, if you're curious, you can, you can uh, Google uh, this funny name, Keep keeps of fish. If you're curious, you can Google this, this title. This is my latest paper. So this translates into Spanish as Montones de Peces. Uh, and it's a, it's a paper about algebra. It's a serious paper about, about algebra. It's not a joke. Um, and you will see that in this paper, we find that when you take, when you take the fish diagram, like this, so when you take, imagine you know all the labels, and these are ternary morphisms like A, B, C. These are three ternary morphisms, and this gets rewritten to a single, uh, you know, A, B, C composition like that. You know, kind of similar to how you do binary composition, but a bit more sophisticated. If you apply, so if you just assume this rule and you apply the principle of diagrammatic or, or uh, yeah, the principle of diagrammatic integrity or diagrammatic simplicity, then this, in, if you build a long fish that looks like that. You know, that has five elements, you have a confluence system, you have a similar diagram, actually, let me just project it. Second, um, also, take the opportunity. Advertise my you can see it's a very convenient name, Art of Science. So, so these are the two main diagrams that we have in our, in our project. Warmian rings, of course, we have the beginning of the lecture, and the fish. So I don't think I'm assuming too big or oh, yeah. Oh, from here. You, you can see the idea. So you, you have this longer fish when you're rewriting is the fish. So you detect a fish on this side, so you rewrite it ABC. You detect a fish on this side, you, you rewrite CDE, but you also detect a fish that is swimming in the opposite direction. Right? So that's the fish in the middle that's swimming in that direction. And they all get rewritten to, to a single final triangle because this is a fish, this is a fish, and this is a fish. And so this uh, diagram imposes you an axiom that looks like the axiom of associativity, but it's relating to three terms that involve five elements. And that is the axiom that is called a heap. It's a, we can Wikipedia heap mathematics and you will find a little axiom that just for, com, for com, com, completion, let me just tell you what the axiom does. So A, B, C, B, E, 
is A, B, C, and then the E, right? You have a ternary operation, so you can do it nested in that way. This should be equal to, um, you can push it to the other side. So A, B, bracket, C, B, E. So this is exactly what you expect from associativity that you can push brackets around, right? So left to right, it works. But this, what happens when I put the bracket in the middle, right? So in the diagram, what so if I put the bracket in the middle? Well, the leftmost and rightmost elements stay the same, but the fish is, is swimming in the other direction, right? This fish was swimming to the right. That fish was swimming to the right. So that's why you know, this fish swimming to the right, this fish swimming to the right, no problem. But the fish in the middle is swimming to the left. So I need to flip the, the order, B, C, D, and it becomes B, C, D. If you, your Wikipedia, this is the axioms of a so-called semi-heap, heap, um, and they were discovered in the 40s and 50s in, in, in Russia, and they were studied. Um, and we have shown that the principle of diagrammatic integrity actually gives you this axiom as well. It gives you all the axioms that we are interested in category theory. It gives you dagger categories. It gives you uh, categorical products. It gives you um, terminal objects, initial objects, all these kinds of things. This is that principle gives you everything, but it also gives you high order stuff that category theory has never seen, like, like this kind of action. So, anyway, uh, that's the end of my course. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, with that, I finish it. Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you.